I want to welcome you today to a webinar that I have not given in a couple of years. The last time I gave it was when I delivered the keynote for the National Hospice and Palliative Care Conference. This is about the connection prescription. It's how to plug into a person in pain without shorting out. And what I've come to learn as a physician, as an entrepreneur, is that pain is pain is pain. There are many kinds of pain. There's physical pain, there's emotional pain, there is financial pain, but when it comes right down to it, all pain is the same. And if you know how to respond to one kind of pain, you know how to respond to another kind of pain. And what I have come to learn is that human connection is powerful medicine. In fact, it might be one of the most important therapeutic tools that we have at a time in which there are no answers. And clearly, you know, in the hospice and palliative care community, um, we learned the importance of human connection. But today, with all of our uncertainties, connection is more important than ever. You know, if you go to light a fire, you know that you can't just begin with one log. You need to have two logs because the thing that actually burns is the gas that's released between the two logs when they get hot. So too, I think this major therapeutic intervention that we're going to need is the human connection. And just think about it, in this time of social isolation, we are, we are being kept from one another. So knowing how to get and stay connected in a different way is going to be very, very important. It can mean the difference between hope and despair right now. And if you look at the kinds of problems that we had in the past, you know, like opioid addiction, um, the epidemic of obesity, I think a lot of that is a response to our previously um, seen human condition of isolation. So isolation does bad things, connection does good things. And so what I'm gonna be offering today is something that I call the connection prescription. Um, I was thinking that, you know, if we can teach people how to respond to somebody who's having a heart attack, um, we can certainly teach people how to get and stay connected with others. And so the ABCs of the connection prescription are turning your attention to the person in pain with the belief that you can make a positive difference with a caring human connection. So, you know, whether you're a financial advisor who's responding to market volatility, or whether your child fell down and scraped his or her knee, or whether um, you are talking with a friend who is in mourning, because they might have just lost somebody. This connection prescription can help you make a difference. I can tell you that I came up with this model over a decade ago, um, and it was to empower people to respond to the pain of loved ones. I took this to the library systems and just got that connection out there and we had evidence that this really makes a difference. You know, in people with chronic pain, um, we found that it reduced opioid requirements. Um, it improved the quality of life and it had stronger families. So this simple system that you're about to use has been proven in the medical community. And I believe that with so much pain today, I think it's a tool that will empower you at home and at work. So the goals of this presentation are, first of all, to understand what do we know about pain? Second, um, how does a person respond to his or her pain? And what is the most effective way of responding to a person in pain? 
So I tell you this from my own experience. I was in a graduate program when I had a surgical emergency myself, and um, I was bleeding internally. By the time I got to the operating room, about half of my blood volume was in my pelvis. So I really thought it was the end. And I was so grateful to wake up that I just knew I was going to be a doctor and save other people's lives like my own had been saved. Um, and my own experience is being a surgeon in private practice and holding a clinical faculty appointment at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Um, for the past two decades, I've been a serial entrepreneur and author and a speaker primarily about the bridge between the world of business and the world of medicine. All right, so what do we know about pain? Well, pain is a call to action. It's our body's way of saying, hey, there is something going on here, pay attention. It's sort of like the warning lights on our car dashboard. It brings attention to the thing that needs attention. And if there's anything I've learned over the years, it's that pain is pain is pain. In the end, there's not a big difference between physical pain and emotional pain and financial pain. Um, I remember visiting my mom in the hospital. Actually, it was about a week before I was supposed to give a present, this very presentation um, at a hospice meeting. And um, my mom, it, it, it's actually kind of a sad story. So my mom has had back pain forever and ever and ever. And she's had many surgical procedures um, for her back pain. Well, about, oh, how long was it ago? Maybe seven or eight years ago, the pain had gotten so bad that she had decided that life was not worth living. And they went from orthopedic surgeon to orthopedic surgeon, trying to find somebody who would repair her, her back. And the surgeons kept on saying no, but finally they did find a surgeon who said yes. So she was so pleased. She understood that she had a real risk of dying in this procedure. But as I told you, she had already decided that death was better than the chronic pain that she was in. So um, she underwent the knife and um, they were successfully able to stabilize her spine and put, take pressure off of the nerve that had been impinged. And you know, she'd been on pretty high levels of opioids even before this operation got started. And uh, so not surprisingly, she needed high level of opioids postoperatively. Well, they got her through the operation. Um, they discharged her to uh, sort of the hotel next to the rest, uh, next to the hospital. And she did fine for the first day until she rolled out of bed, like literally rolled out of bed, was in incredible pain. Um, her husband took her back into the emergency room and they said, you know, well, it's okay, you know, uh, it, after you've had an operation, it doesn't feel real good to roll out of bed, but she's gonna be okay. So they just sent her back to the hotel, but, she was describing like 10 out of 10 pain. So they brought her back into the emergency room, took an x-ray, and sure enough, the, um, the rods had pulled out from her fragile bones. So she bought herself another trip back to the operating room where they stabilized her. Um, Post-operatively, this was devastating for her. Once again, um, there were high requirements for opioids. And her husband called me and said, look, things are, things are bad here. Could you please come out? And so I, I flew out and um, saw her in the post-operative, first post-operative day. And she was completely withdrawn. I mean, she was demoralized. She had been refusing food. 
She had really not wanted to do anything. So the, the very first thing that I did was I took pictures of my son and I put her all, I put them all around the room. And then when she wouldn't talk to me, I started talking with the people in the room, you know, telling stories about her, how brave she was, how courageous she was, how she had just been through other things. And then I started sort of telling stories about her, about, you know, fun things that she had done with my son. And then something magical happened. She started joining the conversation. And um, after, after a while, I asked her if she might be interested in having something to eat. And she agreed to have Jello. And the next day I came back and again, she was sort of withdrawn. I engaged her in conversation and uh, she was willing to eat something. And then you know what? She even was willing to get up into a chair. So we were all having a nice time engaged. And I looked at the clock and I said, oh, I, I, I've got to go here. You know, I've got to get back on a plane so I can go and give this presentation. And as I was leaving, I heard her say all of a sudden, oh, I'm in such pain, get me back into bed. Well, I think what happened was that she was experiencing this pain of separation as physical pain. And so for a lot of people, when they're in emotional pain, they experience it as physical pain. So pain is pain is pain. When you're anxious about money, that is pain. When you're frightened about what the future looks like, that is pain. And it's just as if, you know, you just fell down and broke a bone. Pain is pain is pain. But what we also know is that pain is toxic to the brain. So literally, when you are in pain, you are not functioning as you would if you were not in pain. So the goal of pain is for you to bring attention to the thing that needs to be fixed. You know, get off that sprained ankle. Um, you know, go to the doctor if you've got a gallbladder attack. But if pain goes on and on and on, you respond less well. So, you know, in, in our current environment where we have the pain of worrying about, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to keep myself safe? What about my sadness if somebody is um, infected with COVID-19? What if somebody truly is wondering, how am I going to pay my rent? That pain keeps you from getting to the resources that's going to really, really help you. So pain is toxic to the brain. We want to respond to pain so that it doesn't turn into chronic pain here. And we're in a situation now where we've been isolated in our houses for weeks now. This hurts. This whole situation hurts. And what we want to do is respond to this pain, be able to get to the resources so that we can get through this to the other side. So we want to keep acute pain from turning into chronic pain because chronic pain often leads to isolation and the isolation makes things worse. So another thing that's important to know about the brain is that we are wired to connect. We are social animals. We need each other. And there is something special that happens when we're physically present with other people. So even though we can be connected in this way through technology, it's not the same as being in the same physical space. So knowing how to use our other tools and knowing how to connect in different ways is important. Um, but we are like literally wired to connecting and often this isolation leads to suffering. So what I've learned over my career as a surgeon is that people can take huge amounts of pain. What's intolerable 
is to experience pain in isolation. And that, I believe, is what leads to suffering. So the pain of isolation can be interpreted as physical pain. So pain is pain is pain. Okay, so how does a person respond to his or her pain? And what I believe is that the way somebody responds to the pain is um, is sort of wired in and reinforced through our childhood beliefs. So I believe that all of us have a way that we respond to pain and it's different for everybody. But as I looked at my patients, say who were, were recovering from an appendectomy, they all responded to that sort of differently. They responded to the pain of appendicitis differently. They responded to the post-operative course differently. And so I developed this system um, called my five pain personalities. And let me lay this out for you. And you can see, you know, which kind you are and then think about maybe family members or clients and think about what they are. So the first is the strong stoic. I operated in Seattle where there were a lot of Scandinavians and there's strong stoicism in that culture. So a strong stoic wants to be seen as strong and fit. There's something a little embarrassing about being vulnerable. And so they try to mask their pain as long as possible. They try to sort of grind their teeth and, and grind it out at home. A friend of mine who's a strong stoic said that um, you practically had to be dead before mom took us to the doctor. So strong stoics um, ignore their pain. They like to pretend that there's nothing wrong. They would often come into the doctor much too late. Um, a strong stoic financially will um, be in trouble before they reach out and they try to make things go right. A lot of doctors are strong stoics, and that might explain why a lot of doctors don't go into the financial doctor, the financial advisors, until it's way, way too late. All right, then there's the ostrich. Um, this is the person who kind of hides their head in the sand. Medically, this is the guy popping Tums in the Barca lounger for his heart attack. This Financially, this might be the bon vivant who is just spending and spending and spending, um, trying to ignore the fact that um, there's no way that they're ever going to be able to retire. So what the ostrich wants is the ostrich wants the belief to be everything's okay. You know, there's denial about the things that aren't going to be okay. Um, they just, they wanna pretend everything's okay. So these are like the kids partying in Florida on spring break with the complete denial that we've got a pandemic happening here. All right, then there's the worried well. This is me. Um, this is, you know, the chicken little, the sky is always falling down. So I remember being in medical school studying for an exam about the pancreas. And I read about this really weird pancreatic tumor and I had two of the five symptoms and I was certain I had it, I was going to die. Uh, why even bother you know, studying for this exam? But I did study for the exam um, because um, I, I know myself, I know that I always tend to worry about things. Um, financially, you might have financial worried wells. These might be people who have millions of dollars in assets, but they're always worried that the sky is falling down, that you know they're gonna be bag ladies or bag men one day. Um, and what the worried well really need, and you might know some worried well financially right now, and boy, the, the market volatility and a worried well pain personality are not a good combination. And so if you've got worried wells, what that means is that they they just need to know 
how to respond to this worry. So you're probably connecting with them on a pretty regular basis and reassuring them that, look, we know how to recover from this. There's nothing inherently wrong with the stock market. Um, this Once we get through this pandemic, we will recover again. Um, then there is the victim. And um, the victim sort of is a victim. Um, when I was a practicing physician, you know, the victim would usually come to me with some kind of medical problem and they'd talk about how this doctor and that doctor and the other doctor let them down. And um, so, you know, when I was naive, when I first got started, you know, I would think, okay, well, I'm gonna be the one who helps them. And inevitably I would lay out a plan and um, inevitably they would ignore the plan and I would become the next doctor on that list of doctors who didn't help. And what I really came to understand is that they, they wanted to hang on to their pain. They're, in some strange way, their identity was tied up with being in pain and they didn't want to give it up. So you might have clients like that. Um, they might be a victim of the system, a victim of this, of that. And if you try to help, what you really find is that they they just really want to be in pain. So as I, as I developed more wisdom, what I decided is that I just didn't want to work with victims anymore. And you may want to do the same. And then there was that fifth kind of person. There was that ideal person. They knew when a little deal was a little deal and they knew when a big deal was a big deal. So it's kind of like Goldilocks. It wasn't too much, it wasn't too little, it was just right. And you might know clients financially who do the thing that's just right. Like right now, you're not making panic calls to them about the market volatility because they truly do understand that things are going to be okay. When we get back to this pandemic, we will find a path to recovery. Okay, so why is this important to know? Well, it's because as you respond to somebody in financial pain, once you understand what their pain personality is, then you can respond to them in a way that's most effective for them. Um, further, once your clients have an understanding about what their financial pain personality is, it makes things make a lot more sense because each of these pain personalities is a way that they're responding to the current reality, right? It's kind of like the way you return a tennis serve. And if you know your tennis serve pulls to the left, then intentionally you're gonna try pulling it to the right so that things are okay. So um, let's say, for example, a strong stoic is married to a worried well. Well, they're gonna have conflicts about money because the worried well is concerned about, oh my God, how are we ever going to retire? And the strong stoic is there thinking, okay, I wanna just ignore this. I trust that things are gonna be fine and, and there's gonna be conflicts here. So please feel welcome to share this pain personality system with your clients and then invite them to, just you know characterize themselves what what's my own pain personality um so that they have a little more insight about what's going on here um so again if you've got a strong stoic they um they want and need to be courageous right so if they're reaching out for help and there are going to be new doctors who have been financial do-it-yourselfers who decide, you know what, I, I'm not a financial do-it-yourselfer anymore, I need help. So recognize their courage for reaching out and getting help. Tell them how strong they are. And it takes a lot of strength um, to, to get other people to help them. If you've got an ostrich burying their head in the sand, what they most want is they most want for everything to be okay. So reassure them, things are gonna be okay. We're gonna make a plan and we're gonna get there. 
If you've got a worried well, the most important thing for them right now is to have a plan about how never to worry alone. So my best friend from medical school, um, we have an arrangement whenever I get worried about my son or myself or somebody I, I love having this weird thing, I we have an arrangement where I can just call her up and say, look, here is the latest crazy idea that I have. Um, please just, you know, please just set me straight. And she does and we laugh about it, but it's really reassuring to know that I have a plan. If I'm really worrying, I know what I'm going to do. And you might want to create plans for your financial worried well also, so they are not worrying alone. Um, the victim, I, you know, I, I recommend that you, if you have victim clients, that you really think seriously about not investing too much time and energy there because there are enough people who need you. Um, that you know you might want to invite them to find somebody else who can help them right now. Um, and then the ideal is the ideal. Um, here's some kind of well, some things that you might be interested in. Um, there are certain people who seem to be wired for pain, like redheads experience pain more acutely. Like if I ever had a redhead with a lump or bump, I didn't do it in my office. I took the redhead to the operating room because I know that they have an exquisite sensitivity to pain. And sometimes I've wondered, well, how are redheads doing in this financial crisis? Okay, um, so what is the most effective way to respond to a person in pain? So here's you know, the main course here, the connection prescription. This is actually sort of a set of leadership skills. There are people in financial pain right now, at least in your practice, you are assuming a position of financial leadership. And what is leadership? Well, I love Stephen Covey's definition. Leadership is communicating to others their worth and their potential so clearly that they're inspired to see it in themselves. And so you want to offer this belief and paint the picture of a recovered economy so clearly that people are going to see it for themselves and be able to get from all of the financial uncertainty that we're experiencing today into financial recovery. Okay, so here are the seven steps of the connection prescription. The first is to set the emotional thermostat. So right now, our emotional thermostat nationally is set to anxiety and concern. There is worry about literally life and death. Am I gonna catch this virus? What if my parents catch the virus? What if I know somebody who has caught the virus? So um, I think part of what social isolation has done is it, um, it has made us all feel like this could happen to me. And let me just remind you that most of us will do just fine, even if we are infected. About 80% of the people who are infected will have mild symptoms. So we have this worry about the virus. People have worries about how am I going to meet my expenses today? These people include the doctors who do elective cases and who aren't generating income. It's a worry for the doctors who have gotten sick and are on home quarantine right now. Um, there are worries for people about Am I ever going to be able to retire? So there is worry and anxiety. There is a lot of financial pain out there. And I know that every day, all day, you are talking with your clients who are in financial pain, who have anxiety, and I know that that can take a toll on you. It's also easy to get swept up yourself 
in the anxiety, but you're going to be most helpful to other people. You're going to be in the best position to lead if you do not catch the chaos, if instead you keep calm. So the most important thing that any of us can do today is to keep the calm rather than catching the chaos. And probably the best tool for doing this is something that was taught to me as square breathing. So it's just taking in a deep breath for the count of maybe two or three, then holding that breath for a count of two or three, then exhaling for a count of two or three, and then keeping your lungs empty for a count of two or three. So just like 60 seconds of square breathing can, can keep you calm, can reduce that chaos. Okay, um, step number two is let them take center stage. Let the person in pain take center stage. So imagine that any encounter were be, being conducted in a, a New York theater. There's one chair um, in the limelight and there's plenty of room in the audience. So each of us, we tend to naturally put ourselves in the limelight. Um, but you are most effective when somebody else is in center stage. Okay, so what do I mean? If you're talking with one of your clients and they are um, maybe second guessing a choice that they made in the past, um, you might automatically put yourself in in that chair and, and second guess yourself. Well, should I have made that recommendation back four years ago? Um, but when you're dealing with somebody in pain, it's important to keep them there. So, so let me just describe something, you know, that has nothing to do with finances. So a friend of mine, his name is Dave, his wife had breast cancer and she had actually gone through you know, the original treatment, she had had recurrences a number of times, but this time um, she had had a recurrence to her brain. They were sent to a different facility that was about an hour away for a consultation. And this was bad. This was really bad. And um, Dave's wife had nausea and so she was actually lying down in the back seat because you know lying down made it easier for her and dave describes you know sort of driving and thinking oh my god what am i going to do without this woman in my life and he was sort of thinking those thoughts when he heard some sounds from the back and it was it was his wife crying and he said that throughout the entire treatment course, she had never once cried. And so both of them were dealing with this reality, right? That this looked like it was the beginning of the end. And they were each dealing with what that meant for themselves. But Dave knew that he had to focus on his wife. It was time to think about what this meant to her. It was time to comfort her. It was time to put her in center stage. So when you're dealing with an individual client, you are going to be bringing your own pain. You are going to be bringing your own anxiety. But in that moment, what's going to be most important, you are going to be most effective if you put them in center stage, if you put their concerns at the center. Now, this pain is going to impact you, and you can certainly deal with that offline. But when your clients are in financial pain, it's important for you to put them in center stage. Um, next is shield them from your pain. So you have concerns too. Uh, you know, you have challenges in dealing with all of your clients who are in this pain. And this is tough for you too. 
But again, what you want to do is deal with that offline. I'd be happy to talk with you about what it's like for you right now to be responding to so many people in so much pain. But when you want to help somebody, when you want to be connected, it's just one person at a time. And if you're there to provide leadership to somebody else, you want to deal with your own pain offline. Um, next, you want to master the fine art of verbal persuasion. And this is a skill that can be improved. So remember when I told you about my mom and I was able to distract her by bringing her back to more pleasant thoughts. This is a tool that you too can use as you deal with people in pain and as we deal with this long recovery. Paint a hopeful picture of what things can look like. Describe this hope. Help people stay focused on where we are trying to get to. Like right now, as we are in social isolation, and I'm taping this in the first week of April, so we are all in week two or week three of our social isolation. This hurts. I think it's important for us to remember why we are doing this. We are doing this so that we get to recovery. Okay, you are going to be in the front stage pretty soon. As soon as we get through this COVID wave, we are gonna be turning our attention back to finances, right? And you are going to be the financial doctors. You are going to be the most important people in our society, leading us back to health. And as you do so, I invite you to maintain hope, to be able to paint pictures of the world that we see. You know, go and, and review Martin Luther King's speech. Go see how other charismatic leaders help paint this hopeful future because we are going to need that. We are gonna need you to bring that to us. And people need the constant reminder that we are going to get through this that the markets are fundamentally sound. And I hope that you are ending every conversation with that hopeful belief that we are going to get through this. Um, we are going to return to financial health. Um, all right, next act from your wisest self. Okay, so this, this is really important for you um, as a financial leader. So we all grow and evolve um, sort of like a tree. And if you look at the rings of the tree, you can tell whether the, there have been good years or bad years by the amount of growth. All right, well, we've all had financial traumas. We've all had traumas in our life. And if we have a trauma as a child, then, um, you know, some of us will, have strong parents who help us get through it. Other people will not. Well, the thing is, as we get to our adult lives, if we face a situation that reminds us of that earlier trauma, and then we're triggered, we become that person that we were at that point. So uh, let's talk about like PTSD. So somebody has been in combat in Afghanistan, they faced a traumatic situation, then they come back to the US. And um, every time they hear the truck backfiring, it's sort of like they're back in the war zone in Afghanistan. Like their brain doesn't understand that that is the past and this is the present. Well, um, I was actually just delivering a webinar for doctors about their relationship with money. And this doctor talked about the um, about losing the childhood house in foreclosure. And like every time that um, she has some financial challenge, it's kind of like she's like that frightened five-year-old girl who was forced out of her house by the sheriff. Like it all becomes real. And so 
you know, whenever she has a financial challenge, she approaches it with the resources that she had as a five-year-old. Sort of like she doesn't remember that she's an adult now. She has all sorts of ways of dealing with this situation. As a therapist says, she has car keys and checkbook. And um, she has new resources that she can bring to the world. So if you have any elderly clients and you know they have millions in assets, but they don't want to spend anything because they're afraid of going hungry, well, that person might have lived through the Great Depression. And whenever they deal with money, whenever they're in the corner with money, they sort of go back. And it's as if it's the depression all over again. So you might find that you have clients who are reacting to their current financial reality in a way that's just, it's not normal for them. And they could be reacting to not what's going on today, but went on in their past. So one thing that you might want to do is just ask them, you know, what was your financial childhood like? Um, you know, what did you learn about money? What did your parents teach you about money? Um, did you have any financial situations when you were a child? Um, because if they are able to go back and connect with that early childhood financial trauma, just that process, of understanding that can bring them back to their adult selves when they see that, okay, the childhood is over, this is what I'm dealing with now. But I think as we go through what we're going through right now, there's gonna be a lot of PTSD, right? This is going to scar people. This is gonna be sort of a life-changing event. But as we get through this, you wanna make sure that your clients are dealing with their current reality and not the past. Again, the best way to do this is to ask them about their childhood. And, you know, things were different in, in their childhood. I mean, can you imagine doctors giving out lollipops for good boys or good girls right now? And speaking of childhood, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, if you were ever taught by your parents never to leave your house in dirty underpants, um, because what happens if you're in a car accident? I just want to let you know that I've been in the emergency room a lot of times dealing with a lot of trauma and never once has any doctor or nurse made a comment on the condition of a patient's underpants. So there are some things we learned in childhood that just don't work anymore. Okay, next, know your limits. So my mom was living in Hawaii. I'm telling you a lot of mom stories today. I guess I'm worried about her. Um, my mom was in Hawaii, and um, she was in the emergency room with a gallbladder attack. And she called me up and said, I was living in Washington State. She said, honey, I'm in the emergency room. Can you come and can you take up my gallbladder? And, you know, while that's very flattering, of course, I had to say no. I mean, on one level, I said no for practical reasons. I wasn't licensed to practice medicine in Hawaii. But the other thing is that everyone knows that you don't treat yourself or loved ones because your emotions can cloud your judgment, right? Um, and so I know my limits. I knew that to, in order to truly give the best care to my mother, I needed to say no. So we all have limits and we are all best served when we know and we honor these limits. One of the limits that you might be facing, maybe you're facing it right now, but it is a risk for the future, is burnout. There are only so many people that you can help before you take care of yourself. So I encourage you, to engage in basic self-care. You know, make sure that you're eating well. Make sure that you're getting proper sleep. Make sure that you have your stress management tools. Like what do you do that recharges your soul? 
I would recommend that you get back to that. I'm so excited because I get recharged being out in the garden um, and it's gardening season. I think both introverts and extroverts are having a hard time with the social distancing. So I'm an introvert, but I am living alone right now. And, you know, so I'm kind of at the end of my introversion. I need to figure out more creative ways of getting and staying connected with others. Extroverts in the house are having a really tough time too because they wanna go out and they wanna be with people. So if you're an extrovert, you know, maybe you wanna do more FaceTiming. So take care of yourself right now. Um, take care of your own anxiety. Make sure that you are doing what you can do to get and stay recharged. As we get through the COVID crisis, think about your clients. Are there changes that you need to make to achieve higher levels of performance? Are there clients who you might want to remove from your roles because they have just been too hard? I'm actually firing clients right now. If they are too hard to work with, if they are making too many demands on me, I am graciously inviting them to not contact me because I need to protect my time and my own resources. And I invite you to do the same. We've got to treat ourselves like Ming vases right now. We have to be setting boundaries. We have to be setting limits. We have to know when to say no so that we can all say yes to the bigger calling that we all have in front of us. And then last, I think it's important to know where you're headed. When you have an encounter with somebody in pain, what is it that you want to do? For right now, probably the most important thing when managing somebody in pain or responding to somebody in pain, no matter what the pain is, is to let them know that they are not alone. You are there. Um, you might not have the answers right now, like your clients might be asking you for answers. We don't know the answers because we, we're facing an uncertain future. But what you can reassure people is that they are not alone. They're not the only person facing this pain. They are not um, the only person who is feeling scared, who's feeling alone but they are not alone. You are there. And I recommend that you regularly stay in touch with people. Hopefully you're calling your clients on a regular basis. Hopefully you're exploring ways of leveraging a message so that you can send out emails or you can send out um, videos, or maybe you even have regular town hall meetings so that you can let other people know that they are not alone either. So, Right now, at this pivotal time in our country's history, know that you are enough. Whatever you have right now is enough to help people in pain, to help stave off suffering by making sure that people know that they are not alone. So genuinely, I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work that you do. Um, you are going to be in the second pandemic. You are going to be on the front lines. And I am here to support you to do what I can to you. So I'm just wondering, um, was this helpful? Are there other things that you are doing when you respond to people in pain? And, you know, I invite you to either raise your hand or type into the question box. You know, what was what was the pearl that you are going to take and you are going to implement as you move forward here. Oh, you financial advisors, you are so shy. All right. Well, I'm not getting any questions here publicly, but please do feel welcome to, um, to reach out to me if there is anything that you want or need. 
think about this week, maybe sharing the pain personalities and asking people that you're in contact with, hey, what's your pain personality? And then think about how they might want to adjust their innate responses to pain so that they wind up you know, with a ball where they want it to get to if you're using the metaphor of a tennis serve. Ooh, okay, we have a question here. Ruben, let me uh, unmute you. And you are welcome to ask your question, Ruben. So, uh, so you should have the mic. Please feel welcome to speak up. Hi, and I'm not... Hey Ruben. there, hey, nice to speak with you. Yes, likewise. I've been listening to you for quite a while now and I've gotten a download of your books and they were pretty good. Oh, thank I've, you. I've shared them actually with others. Um, no, I actually don't have a, a question in fact. I mean, I know one of the things that uh, most of the clients are, are pretty reserved at this time. And I guess what I'm trying to do is trying to get a way to, to get them to open up. And when you say open up, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I think it's because maybe I'm trying to get them to at least uh, have them talk about their situation financially and also with with what's going on with their uh, situation with the COVID-19 uh, uh -huh. arena. Okay. And of course, uh, because they are busy and they are with family and they're all concerned. And I believe opening them up with financial issues is a little bit more challenging. Right. Well, I think that what we need to do is we need to recognize where people are at. Um, so I think right now, you, you never quite know what's up with somebody, but as a nation, I think right now that the focus is on COVID. And I do think that um, once we are over this, people are going to look um, at their finances in a different way. So as you approach any individual, um, you know, some of the, the questions that you might want to ask is, you know, what would keep you, what would get you up at night? If you were to wake up at three in the morning, what would be the thoughts that got you there? So that you make sure that you're responding to where somebody is at. Everybody is in pain right now. But what I've observed is that everybody is in pain in a different way. So, um, so you might want to just ask them, you know, how are things going for you? Um, what is, um, you know, what is the thing that you're most worried about? What causes you the biggest source of anxiety? And um, if you've got that kind of trust with them, they will tell you. Um, might I just ask Ruben, what is your business? Are you a financial advisor? Uh, yes, I am, but I'm primarily more into the uh, insurance industry. Okay, but still in the insurance industry, I mean, your clients are so lucky that you're there. Are, are, you, are you using insurance as a way of building wealth? Yes, yes, and actually okay. I brought okay. up the idea All about right. uh, the things that we've talked about before, and okay. they seem to, you know, they're just a little bit more timid, I guess, at this time to talk about it, but I know they're concerned because they brought that up themselves. They're concerned about what? Well, a lot of them are concerned now that because uh, maybe the insurance product that they have currently does not have the latest and greatest uh, available out there uh, as far as uh, uh, living benefits. That's one of the things that I promote. And a lot okay. of the ones that they have don't have that. Okay, so I am here to help financial advisors acquire more doctor clients, right? And very early on, I had recommended that you guys go out there and reach out to the husbands and wives of people infected with COVID and you offer, you know, you suggest that they 
upgrade their disability and life insurance. But you know what? Right now, most insurance companies have closed their doors to applications for anyone exposed to COVID-19, and that includes physicians. Um, so this is not going to be the time to look at changing insurance products, especially if you're working with doctors, because it's just not going to be a possibility right now. But what you can do is, you know, say to them, I think it's so great that you're actually taking a look at this question. Let us take a look at the bigger picture and let's make sure that you're really doing everything that you can. Right now, if you're working with doctors, my guess is that they are just worried about cash, like cash flow today. Like what happens if um, something happens to me? And probably the best thing you can do right now is make sure that all the beneficiaries are set up correctly. They're not gonna be able to get new insurance, but they should right. make sure everything's in place. Um, but what are these people worried about? Um, and, and uh, you know, you might even consider having a town hall meeting. I, do, what? <laughs> uh, who are your major clients? Well, the clients that I go after now are basically their uh, heirs. Because primarily the doctors that I, I had contact with were more closer to retirement or are retired. But now they're more concerned about the uh, certainties that their kids are getting into the uncertainties basically and they're all concerned about the uh, the, okay. the market the market of course and so we talk about what the possibilities are of uh, acquiring certainties including the insurance industry got it got it so not if... necessarily in the stock market because they seem to have doubts now of that so a lot of them are basically doubtful of what's going on with the market. And, and I, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm kind of having doubts as well as far as getting them directed into certain certainties in the stock market. So I uh, utilize the insurance industry as part of the certainties that we talk about. Okay. Um, so, um, all right, so the the conversation we're having right now, this is in our thinking brains, right? This is in our cerebral cortex. And our, our thinking brain asks the appropriate question. You know, how do I make sense of the market? What should I be doing? But that's not where the pain is. The pain is on an emotional basis. And so, I think that what you want to do is you really want to get tight into what is the feeling state. Like maybe, maybe, so what is it that they really want? Do they want to make sure that they've set things up uh, for their kids? I would just, I would try to connect with the emotion that they're feeling. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Yes, yes, thank okay. you, yes. So what, what is the emotion? What is the anxiety? What is the worry? So I think our best question is, if you got yes, up at I, two I, in the morning, what keeps you up at night? Yes, I, I think maybe I will be drilling in into that uh, section because okay. that I believe is probably what they're looking for. Is this for me is to ask. it. This is it. We are in this time of emotional upheaval, right? because we've never faced this before. We don't have any roadmap for dealing with this. And there are so many people in fight or flight. Like they might be so scared that they don't even know what question to ask you, right? And so that's why they're asking about insurance questions. Right. So just encouraging people to get calm, get out of their reptile brain. So I think of the brain kind of like a three-story house and the thinking brain is like the upstairs, right? That's where the solutions to our problems are. Um, that's the thinking brain. On the main floor is the emotional brain. And neuroscience tells us we make most of our choices with our emotional brain and then justify it with our thinking brain. But then when we're in fight or flight, we are in our reptile brain. That is the basement. That is the, you know, that is my life is 
immediately threatened. And we are facing this unprecedented situation of worrying about our very core survival. Like, am I going to die of COVID-19? And I think the social isolation has really reinforced that. And oh my God, am I going to be able to pay my bills? Am I going to be able to get those resources that are going to keep me alive? And so most people are in the basement. They are just scared to death. And yeah. so that's where they need to sort of take that deep breath. And they need to know that, okay, you're not alone. We're going to get through this together. Those are really the people that you want to reach. And those people that you think are upstairs thinking about the market, uh-uh, I'm going to argue with you. They're in the basement. They, they fear for their very survival. And as you meet anyone, you should assume that they are there. And your very first job is to ask them, how are you doing? And calm them down. And I see that Bill, Bill, I'm so welcome here. Let me unmute you so that you can join the conversation too. And by the way, thank you for your kind words um, about my presentations. They're all on my blog. Um, I'm putting all the replays up right away. So you can go and re-listen to anything. You know, it's kind of funny. Things change so quickly that the things that we were talking about like four weeks ago, a lot of them is, you know, outdated. But welcome, Bill. Welcome. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, good. But you can't see me, can you? I cannot. I cannot. But tell us, what do you have to say? Well, I've been fascinated with your uh, presentation in the middle of tax season doing tax returns. And I just wanted to make certain that I could listen to it again. You've got some really powerful ideas and thoughts. And I'm really oh. glad I took this time to be with you. Thank, thank you. I am so humbled and I'm so honored um, because I know you and to have that coming from you um, means the world to me. So thank you. And yes, this replay will be back up. Um, and I probably will be doing this again. Um, I had to reschedule it because I did an emergency um, presentation last Thursday. So I'll be doing it again. But yes, they will be up. I will be doing more. Hey, um, let how me just ask you. Yeah, how can we hear the emergency presentation? Um, you can go to Targeting Doctors here. Let me just show you. Are, are people actually doing their taxes right now? Oh, yeah, I'm all caught up. Really? I give, my clients, a, I give my clients a super discount for reporting in early. <laughs> oh, how lovely. Okay, so if you go to um, my blog, so go to Targeting Doctors, go to my blog, and um, here's the emergency session from Thursday, how to help doctors in the COVID world. Targetingdoctors.com? Uh-huh. You can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. So here's what the homepage looks like. And if you go over here to the blog, you can just scroll through. And um, I've got all sorts of things here. Wonderful. Yes, and feel welcome to share this. Oh, even better. Okay, and like get people to sign up, you know, to to get my my publications because we we all need each other. We Absolutely. all need to be in a situation where we're we're helping others. Um, so let me ask you guys, as long as you're on the line, how can I help you? Like, how can I be of service to you? This webinar was incredibly good and I love your upbeat voice and your style. Oh, thank you. It's a happy presentation. <laughs> um, good, good. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, what would you like to learn about? Like what skills or tools would be helpful for you? You were talking about pain styles. Uh-huh. Yeah. There is a gal up in Lafayette, California, just about four miles from where I live, who wrote a book about 10 years ago called the How to, How to Read a Prospect from Across the Room. 
or how to read a client from across the room. And uh -huh. she was talking about how they dressed and you could, you could pinpoint what kind of personality they were, whether they were a nerdy person or whether they were outgoing person, whether they would be friendly if you walked up to them and said hello. Um, and I think you probably could work, write a similar book based upon your pain. Oh, um, I thank you. Thank you. That's very kind um, to say that. I was actually thinking it might be fun to have a quiz, like what's your pain personality quiz, and maybe even use that as a prospecting tool for you. Get her book. All right. I will. I will. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Well, listen, I know how busy you are. I, I genuinely want to thank you for being here and attending this. And um, stay tuned for the next one because I've been doing these webinars all the time. And um, I'm, I'm here to help. So just let me know how I can do that. All right. Well, let us know how we can help you. Thank you very much. Spread the word. Spread the word is a good one. All right. Well, take good care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. My pleasure.